Rising Star Award received in 2018, and a senior member of IEEE and also a member of ELIS. He is co-chairing the Audiovisual Machine Perception and Interaction for Companion Robots Chair <coughs> of the Multidisciplinary Institute of Artificial Intelligence. Finally, Xavi is also the coordinator of the H2020 project Spring, Socially Pertinent Robots in Gerontological Healthcare. Xavi's research interests include combining machine learning, computer vision and audio processing for the scene and behavior analysis and human-robot interaction. So, Xavi, thank you very, very much for accepting our invitation. And the floor, or in this case, the screen is all yours. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me clearly. Uh, thanks for the... I wanted to thank um, the, the organizing committee for uh, giving me the opportunity to explain what part of what we are doing in the perception team. Uh, so in the team, we are uh, focusing on uh, on robotics application and let's say uh, on on let's say low level social intelligence or you know what the robot needs to do to be able to discuss with people to understand what's going on around to see where people are, etc. And uh, so you can imagine that we have a wide variety of methodological um, uh, tools. And one of them are uh, variational tone color. So when I was discussing with uh, Pablo on what to discuss today, uh, we agreed that I could explain uh, what we are doing in the team, but also um, what what is the methodology uh, of the variational tone color. So uh, let's say that today I am going to uh, first uh, discuss a little bit some general uh, properties and characteristics of variational tone colors, and then I'll detail uh, an application that we addressed in the team, which is audiovisual speech enhancement, and for which we proposed uh, three and well, a bit more uh, different architectures that are based on VA. Um, so is uh, I'm I'm going to do this this uh, talking in English because it's easier for me to uh, explain all these concepts in English. But if you would like to ask questions uh, in Spanish uh, after that, this is perfectly fine with me as well. So if English is a problem for you, don't don't hesitate to ask uh, questions in Spanish. Okay, so why would we like something like variational auto? So let's start for something from something that you have probably seen many, many times, but it, I think it's good to remind this, is that in the not, in the not so, uh, um, not so long ago, so kind of 10 years ago uh, or 15 years ago, uh, machine learning was done in a two-step way or at least two-step or even more in which we would first extract some features from the input sample. It could be an image or a, 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 an audio sample. And once we had these features, we would uh, train a classifier. And these features were, let's say, supervised, if we want to use this word, by the know-how of scientists and researchers. So examples of these are SIFT, SURF, uh, but also the smell uh, frequency capture coefficients in which people that knew about the signal they were studying uh, decided to uh, that this or that feature would be a good representation. And then once this was done, they were training a classifier. Well, then deep learning arrived. And uh, with deep learning, we are uh, jointly learning uh, the classification and the feature extraction. So this is why on the top, on the bottom part of the drawing, there is uh, there is no feature extraction, so everything is put all together, and this is supervised by the task. For instance, image classification or object detection, or there are many of them. Right? So the features that we are now extracting are not handcrafted or directly designed by a scientist but they are um, supervised, they are trained for the task at hand. 
Well, and after we saw this was possible, so people started asking if we could learn the features in an unsupervised way. So one possibility would be to train an architecture that is, let's say, having a first part that is in green here that we call an encoder, then a second part, which is in blue, it's called a decoder, right? Then this part in red in the middle is called bottleneck usually because it has uh, much fewer dimensions than the raw data that is uh, denoted here by X. Now, uh, the, the ideally one would like that X, which is the original sample and X prime, which is a reconstruction um, are identical. So typically one can just use the, uh, the Euclidean uh, distance, for instance, to train uh, the encoder and, and decoder. Now, uh, these, these, these autoencoders um, are able to, to represent the data unsupervisedly, but they are not a generative model from the probabilistic point of view. And given the popularity of probabilistic models, uh, and I'm not talking now about deep probabilistic models, but about probabilistic models in the, in the machine learning community, like you can think about HMMs, for instance, for speech recognition, or GMMs for, for representation. So people started wondering how to learn a probabilistic model that it is actually deep and that it, and therefore we can, we can learn the features that are extracted, um, but still having the probabilistic interpretation uh, behind this model so that then for instance, you could mix this probabilistic model with other existing probabilistic and this is how, this is my understanding, these variational encoders were born. The reason I'm saying this is that variational encoders uh, can be seen as either the probabilistic extension of plain autoencoders or the deep or nonlinear extension of probabilistic principal, com principal component scenarios. So for those who know PPCA, um, variational autoencoders are a nonlinear extension of this probabilistic model. So, because uh, uh, they are this, these two extensions, they have certain interesting properties that I announced here. And I would like to um, to better explain in, in the following slides. So, we are of course able to learn the complex distribution of the data. Okay. Uh, this means that there is there will be a nonlinear relationship, probabilistic relationship between a latent variable like in PPCA and the data, which is what we observe. And uh, more importantly, perhaps in terms of uh, data processing, uh, these are implemented with deep neural networks, and they are optimized via stochastic gradient descent. So this means that all what at the time we had to learn uh, as a community, I mean, uh, from training deep neural networks with stochastic gradient descent, GPUs, et cetera, could now be applied to learning this uh, deep nonlinear probabilistic. So this is my understanding of how VAE were born. And now I'll, on, the, on the, next, um, the next minutes, I'd like to explain the fundamentals of VA. So the objective is to learn uh, a data distribution. So of course, my data distribution this, this, that is shown here as P data, um, we, we never know an analytic expression of this P data. Okay, so the, we never have access to this. We don't, we don't even know if such an analytic uh, description of the data distribution exists. Um, but we would like to learn a probability distribution P theta that approximates this P data. Okay. And one of the interest of this is that we can then sample. Once we have learned P theta, we can sample and generate uh, samples that we have never seen before. So if we have a training set, this means a bunch of images, for instance, in the go, but it could be audio samples, it could be whatever you want, uh, images, 
I will insist on that later, but here we don't need any labels, right? We are, this is an unsupervised model. So we just need the, the raw data. We assume, of course, that these images of are, you know, follow the data distribution. And if we attempt to optimize or minimize the kalberg labor divergence between the data distribution and the distribution that I am learning, this Pitita, to actually obtain the best parameters, we can uh, easily see that this boils down as maximizing the average log value. So this shouldn't be surprising to anyone. Um, it's, uh, we have, this is very generic, okay? So it's not only related to PAEs. You could do that with GMM, you could do that with HMM. This is usually when one, when one tries to maximize um, when, when you train a probabilistic model. But it comes from minimizing the cooperative divergence between the real distribution and uh, your model, which is PTT. Now, in the case of flattened variable models, what one usually assumes is that uh, you have your uh, observation that will be denoted here by S, and then for each observation, there is a latent variable, which is supposed to be a very concise representation of the samples of the observed variable S. Okay, so in probabilistic PCA, as well as in VAE, which uh, conceptually is quite the same, uh, the dimension of the latent variable that is also called the bottleneck, it's the same bottleneck as in uh, deterministic autoencoders, this dimension is much smaller than the dimension of the data. So this is why it's a concise uh, representation. So the problem, let's say, in VAEs is that we have this integral here that you can see in the slide, uh, as I will explain uh, better a bit later. So if, this in, if one can compute this integral efficiently, then you have an analytic model for, uh, so p theta, you have an analytic expression. If you cannot compute this integral, then you cannot have this analytic expression, and then your optimization or your learning becomes a bit uh, trickier. This is exactly the same problem as, as uh, GANs, generative adversarial networks, but they treat this problem in a different way. Um, so now the question is exactly how to optimize the parameters theta, given that this integral uh, cannot always be computed. So we will first see uh, discuss a case in which we can compute that, and we will pass uh, through that quite uh, fast. And then we will focus uh, in the case that it is more interesting for us, in which uh, this integral can be computed. So. In both cases, usually the latent variable uh, is assumed to follow a standard multivariate Gaussian distribution. Now, in the linear case, which corresponds to actually probabilistic PCA, your model, so P theta, the, the conditional model, is assumed to be a linear transformation of the latent variable. Or, uh, okay, this is an affine transformation, but the, the problematic, the, the, the outcome is the same. Now, with this, the estimation of the parameters, which would be the, this matrix A, the vector mu, and uh, the variance sigma, is very straightforward. But the problem is that the model is very limited in terms of expression. We can only think about linear or affine transformations of a little bit. Now, if we want to go to something a bit more general, uh, we can imagine that uh, our Gaussian distribution is not going to be an affine transformation of the latent variable, but it is going to be a nonlinear transformation of the latent variable. So the mean and the covariance matrix are going to be, let's say, arbitrary nonlinear transformations of the latent variable. So of course, this is much more powerful than the previous model. In, in particular, because the previous model is a particular case of the nonlinear Gaussian model. Right? So uh, the problem now is that in order to estimate the parameters, we need to resort to something that is a bit more difficult and challenging than in the previous case. So this is the principle of uh, variational autoencoders, and now we are going to try to understand where uh, does the optimization problem of VAE come from. So <clears throat> as I said at the beginning, 
we would like to maximize the log likelihood. But because that integral that I showed at the beginning um, cannot be computed analytically, we don't have an analytical expression for this log likelihood. Now, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to use uh, two mathematical tricks. The first one is that I can pick up whatever distribution I have on the latent variable Z and take the expectation. And because the log of P theta of S does not depend on Z, then taking the expectation does not. So this is a trick. And then the second trick is that I can I multiply and divide by exactly uh, the same quantity, which would be the posterior distribution of Z given S uh, following the model, so P theta, and then exactly this, this distribution cube C of Z, okay? So until here, I did nothing but using mathematical tricks. Then why do I want to do that? Now, the first reason is that I can, and I, it's not obvious to see this um, on the fly. So you just trust me. You can rewrite the expectation that you have on the second line as uh, what you have in the third line. And now for those who know the expectation maximization algorithm, you obtain um, what you use then for the expectation maximization algorithm. So, in the EM algorithm, the E step consists of minimizing the Kalbach labor diversion that you have on the right. If you can minimize it uh, to zero, it means that your Q cube C of Z is going to be the posterior distribution. And there you are going to take this posterior distribution, put it on the first term, and then obtain what is the so-called complete expected complete determinant likelihood what, that you are going to maximize the surface of the parameters theta. So this is what is done in an EM algorithm. And this is done that way because P theta, so the, the, sorry, the posterior distribution that you have on the right part of the slide, this P theta of Z given S can be computed analytically. You have an analytic expression of this P theta. This is not the case in variational term colors. So you, you cannot use the term on the right. It's just Forbidden. I mean, you will never be able to even sample from this or approximate this term or something like this. So what people do when they have um, to optimize a VE, they just ignore this term. Okay, uh, sorry, so I didn't go through the slides, so that was the idiom instead. Uh, they just ignore this term. So you put it here in gray, and because this term is um, non-negative, they end up with this inequality. So the expression that you see now in the last line, which is a rewriting on, on the black part of the third line is a lower bound of what I want to optimize. And then I hope that if I am optimizing this quantity, I will be somehow optimizing also the log likelihood. So it is not certain because it's a lower bound, but I am hoping for that. And we write, we rewrite this, um, this into two terms, um, because this is how it's usually interpreted in, in VAE. So we have the first term, which is the reconstruction term, and the second term is the regularization. So in the regularization term, I am trying to make this cube C as close as the prior on Z, which I remember, I recall it was a standard uh, multivariate Gaussian. And on the reconstruction term, I am optimizing uh, this quantity here which is basically the log likelihood um, of S once I have taken the expectation over Z. Um, yes, so these are the two terms and uh, this is what is so-called evidence lower bound. Sometimes it's referred to as variational lower bound. Um, and as I said, this is lower bound of what we, what, what we originally wanted to optimize. So we hope that by maximizing this lower bound we are also pushing the log likelihood um, and, and therefore maximizing also the log likelihood. So um, in the particular case of VAE, this Q of, of C, which is, which is approximating the posterior, is chosen to be uh, also a Gaussian distribution that has um, parameters mu and sigma that are nonlinear functions of the sample S, okay? So you can imagine that this is the same, it's a, it, it was the same, you can see uh, for the generative model, P theta of S given Z 
is a Gaussian and the mean and uh, covariance matrix are uh, nonlinear functions of Z parameterized by theta. So this is what is so-called the generative model or the decoder. And then the posterior distribution or its approximation, which is the cube C is also a nonlinear function. This time is a nonlinear function of S. And this is also the called the encoder. Okay. So you have understood by now, I guess that both nonlinear functions are implemented with deep neural networks. Okay, so you have here an example that is used on images. Um, so on the right, uh, the part on the right is the so-called decoder, and it's a neural network with the parameters theta, a certain set of parameters. And on the left, you have the encoder, which is also a neural network with a different set of parameters that we call uh, psi. So just to go on with the methodology, uh, I remind that um, we have this evidence lower bound that we want to optimize. Um, the regularization term that you have on the right is something that you can compute in closed form because, uh, because the expression for the callback labor divergence between two multivariate normal distribution exists. So this has an, a certain analytic expression. Um, the term on the right, however, cannot be computed closed form because um, you have a nonlinearity in the decoder. So this logarithm of p theta of s given z is a nonlinear function of z. And therefore, you cannot take this expectation. You don't know how to do it. So you resort to sample. So basically, you sample from the posterior distribution. And then you replace this sample into um, into the as so basically you are taking you're replacing the expectation with one point of the distribution of course you could do this with many many points okay you will have an average uh, an average sum of the the number of samples okay but the principle is the same um so now you have a sampling operation here that is posing a bit of a problem because you can see all operations in this approximation of the ev uh, evidence lower bound are differential, right? So the Colbert labor divergence that you have on the right is differentiable with respect to Psi. Um, the the nonlinearity of the decoder is differentiable with respect to theta. However, the sampling operation is not differential. If you take a sample of a distribution, then it's difficult to compute the derivative of this sample with respect to the parameters of the distribution. In our case, because we are using um, normal distributions, we can do something that is called, well, that is in the variation of the encoder uh, word is called the reparameterization tree. So basically you sample from a standard normal distribution and you multiply by the variance, actually by the square root of the variance to be more precise, there's a small mistake here, and then you add the mean. And when you do that, of course, your, your zip C has the distribution cube C. But the important point now is that you have decoupled the sampling because now you sample from a standard normal distribution from the parameters. And in this way, now your, um, your, um, your reconstruction term now is differentiable with respect to the parameters of C. Okay, so with this, we can... Um, we can later discuss. I know it's, uh, it was a bit short, but I wanted to give you an overview of the fundamentals. Now I'll give two precise examples. Um, so the so just before, it's just to uh, emphasize the fact that we don't need any labels here. So you can see that uh, our training set is going to be a set of samples, and we are only using this set of samples. There are no annotations here. So you just need a bunch of images, a bunch of sounds, a bunch of text, or whatever you want to represent to learn these variational return codes. Um, so one first example could be faces. Okay, you take a data set of faces, and then you learn how to represent these, uh, these faces. And of course, to do that, you need two things. First, an architecture, and then you also need to choose your generative model. So let's start with the architecture, which is a bit more graphical, and you have it here on the bottom. Now, because you are working with images, 
naturally you can use convolutions and deconvolutions or let's say uh, upsampling convolutions if you want. Um, because of course uh, images has a have a certain special structure that you want to exploit. Now, in terms of the um, loose, the, the, the loss that you choose, sorry, uh, what it is usually done is to is that the generative model uh, is supposed to be what we call an isotropic Gaussian with unit covariance matrix. So basically, uh, you don't have two nonlinear functions. Remember that when I presented this in the general case, we had mu of theta and sigma theta. And now you assume that sigma theta is the identity. So your covariance matrix is identity matrix. And you only have this mu of theta. And in that case, your reconstruction loss is equivalent to the Euclidean distance. So maybe if you start from, uh, uh, let's say, a divulgation or material that some people choose to uh, explain the VAEs saying that, well, you have your reconstruction loss is the Euclidean distance. This is one possible choice, and it is equivalent to, to choose that the covariance matrix is the, the, uh, the unit, so the identity, right? But you have many more options out there. And I think it is interesting to remind you that this is also possible. In particular, because for other applications like audio, you will have other choices. So in audio, uh, we usually represent the signal um, with an SDFT. Okay, for those who don't know uh, SDFT, um, so you basically take, uh, you have the original signal in blue on the top, and then you take windows of this signal. And for each window, you compute a discrete Fourier transform. So the, in, in some way, you basically analyze the frequential control of the signal within a given window. And then you, of course, you slide this window over time, and this gives you the evolution of the, of the frequential content over time. Anyway, you end up again with a matrix uh, or if you want a sequence of vectors um, and you usually give uh, the square of the magnitude that is represented here uh, to the VA. Okay. And in terms of probability distribution, this corresponds to assume that your spectrogram, which is a complex uh, vector, follows a zero-centered complex circular Gaussian. And this is equivalent to say that you don't care because a zero center means that mean is zero here. Um, and that you don't, so therefore you don't care about the mean anymore. You assume it's zero and you pay attention to the variance of the Gaussian. And the same way that in the previous case, this was equivalent to uh, use a reconstruction loss that was the Euclidean distance. In this case, is it, this is equivalent to use the Itakura Saito divergence which I mean, it's not important, really important what it is now, but it is also uh, to tell you that there are, it's another interpretation of having this. So depending on your choices of the model, you will have different interpretations. Okay. Uh, setting the covariance to the identity and having uh, and estimating the mean is not the only choice that you have. And of course, in that case, uh, you don't have convolutional and, and the convolutional layers, you have just uh, fully connected. This is actually what we are going to use, uh, to be using in the following, uh, in which I'm going to be discussing uh, unsupervised uh, audiovisual speech enhancement using variational audiovisual. So let me first introduce the task. Um, speech enhancement is uh, the task of extracting a clean speech that we are denoting here by S from a noisy mixture that here is noted by X, okay? Um, so we assume that there is some noise signal that uh, comes to here to corrupt S, uh, but at test time, and this is important, we do not have access to S, we only have access to the noisy mixture of X. And given this noisy mixture, we want an estimate S hat of the clean speech. Now, in our case, um, we would like to use not only the uh, noisy mixture X, but also uh, visual data. So you can imagine that lead movements can provide uh, a lot of complementary information uh, to, to reconstruct the speed signal. And um, what we would like to do is to devise uh, uh, strategies 
to efficiently fuse audio and, and visual data for the particular task of speech enhancement. So in the literature, we can see two different paradigms for this. First one is a so-called supervised uh, paradigm. And in that case, the uh, autoencoder uh, architecture, it inputs uh, visual frames and noisy speech and outputs the clean or enhanced speech. So in a way, the, uh, this architecture here learns how to use video frames to denoise the input speech. Now, the limitation here is that you have to train this network with the kinds of noise that you want to be able to denoise the speech. So in, in other ways, and, and we have experiments in that, when, when you test this, such a network on noise types that have very different characteristics for the ones, uh, from the ones use at training time, that the network fails to uh, denoise speech, okay? This is one thing. And the second thing is that at test time, when you have noise, the network cannot specialize in the kind of noise that it is seeing. So there is a second paradigm, and this is the one that, uh, that we have chosen for, is that, uh, it's called unsupervised. And what we are going to do is we are going to learn a generative network, a generative model, sorry, for the clean speech. So using only clean data at, the, at training time, there is no noise in our case. And then at test time, we are going to estimate the models of the noise at the same time we clean the speech signal. Okay, so in another way, uh, I mean, if I want to explain this in, in a different way, at train time, uh, we train, we learn the optimal parameters theta, which are supposed to represent the data distribution of the clean speech. And at test time, we fix these parameters theta and we learn the parameters of the noise. Knowing that at test time, what we observe is the mixture between the clean speech and the noise. Okay? So it's kind of a difficult problem to estimate the parameters of the noise when you don't have noise samples, okay? You, the only way to have access to these noise samples is through a mixture between clean speech and noise. So we have applied, so we have proposed these um, three different architectures that are based on this principle. And I'll go through them. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give some details for one of them, but not for all of them because there are lots of equations at some point and it, it's difficult to explain um, the mathematical details um, you know without sitting down and having a whiteboard so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of uh, skip skip this uh, deep mathematical part um, just to present the first uh, contribution um, we have considered on top of what we are proposing we have considered first let's say an audio only VAE so this would be a VAE that reconstructs audio from audio. Uh, as you may have seen this from images, or this is a very standard way of thinking about VAEs. Uh, we have also considered a VAE that is trying to reconstruct the audio only from vision. Okay, so this, is, this is a very challenging task, as you can imagine, because the visual data does not contain um, all the information needed to reconstruct the speech signal. Um, and then uh, our proposal that is inspired by conditional variational autoencoders is to um, have a uh, decoder that is uh, decoding the speech both from the latent variable that is here denoted by Z and the visual features that are here denoted by, uh, by V, okay? So our decoder is using the visual data to, uh, to reconstruct the speed signal. So is the encoder. We don't have, uh, we don't have any choice. Um, but in a more architectural uh, 
way of saying this, uh, you have the visual data that is basically being concatenated to the latent code in the decoder that you have on the upper right, to the input audio sample in the encoder on the upper left, and uh, of course, to the prior of the latent variable that you have here in the box. Okay, so you basically use the uh, visual data everywhere, you, uh, everywhere possible in your, in your architecture. Uh, now, when we want to train that, of course, what we have are the thin uh, speed spectrogram denoted by S and the associated visual frames denoted by V. Now, one problem that we face here, and then let me put this diagram here uh, back so that you understand. If you take this architecture we have on the top and you want to train this architecture to reconstruct S from S and V, what, what this network is going to do is ignore the visual signal because there is no need, right? I mean, if you have S, uh, certainly in S, you have all the information to reconstruct S. The problem is that at test time, S is very is corrupt by noise. Okay, um, so in a way, at train time, we need to enforce the encoding decoding procedure to exploit the visual signal. So then it learns how to do that, and at, at test time, it will be able to do it as well. So to do so, we did a very simple uh, trick uh, on this very long equation. Uh, that can be a little bit scary, but it's it's you know it's going to be fine. Uh, in the bottom part, which is multiplied by y minus alpha, you have the standard loss of the VA. Okay, so in other ways, if alpha is equal to zero, you have the standard loss of the VA. Now, if alpha is greater than zero, uh, then you can see that th this you have the first line, which is enforcing the prior distribution of uh, Z to be able to reconstruct the signal, okay? So it's somehow a reconstruction loss, but instead of having the posterior distribution here of the latent code, you have the prior distribution. And in a way you are forcing the decoder to be able to reconstruct the speed signal from uh, the, the prior distribution of the latent code. So this is how we, so this is written here. We give some reconstruction power to the prior network. And this is how we enforce the network to be able to take the visual data into it. So this was for the train. Now at test time, things change. Because as I said, we don't have S anymore, we have X which is a mixture between the clean speeds that I don't have access to and the noise that I don't have access to either, by the way. Now we assume some model for the noise uh, for those who know it's not negative matrix factorization, but we don't need to get into details. Um, so the parameters of the noise uh, that you can see here on, on the bottom parameters to be estimated are eta and this we need to be to estimate this. This is difficult, but it it's very flexible in the sense that we will learn the noise at test time. And therefore we will be able to uh, cope with uh, various uh, types of noise. Uh, and what we observe now are the, the mixture here, X and the visual data. And of course my latent variables are still the code, the, the latent code Z, okay? I, I remind you that the generative model that I have trained beforehand stays fixed. Okay, so uh, this uh, this theta here, uh, I learned it with this variant of the uh, evidence lower bound, and this stays fixed at test time. Okay, so once I have trained that, I block it, and at test time, um, I leave it as it is. So now you're gonna believe me if I do this. Um, I, I need a Monte Carlo EM algorithm at test time to infer the optimal parameters of the noise, which are here eta star. And then once I have this eta star, then I can reconstruct the clean speed signal with this formula that you have on the bottom of the slide. 
Now, this is very ugly. So let's just take one minute to understand this. Uh, what you have within the expectation, let us take, uh, let's start with this. It is very similar to the Wiener field. So sigma s is the power of the clean speech. And uh, this term here, wh, remember, is the parameters of the noise. So this wh is the power of the noise. Okay. So what, what it is telling me this is that if this coefficient that I have inside is close to one, which in other words, this means that the noise has very little power compared to the signal, then I have to multiply the, the corresponding entry of the spect of the noisy spectrogram by one, okay? So if for a certain time frequency point, the noise has much less power than the signal, I take the noisy input as the signal that I want to, rec to recover. Right. Then let's take the opposite case. Imagine that the noise power is very high compared to my uh, to the power of the clean speech. And in that case, the co this coefficient here inside the expectation is going to be close to zero. And therefore it's better not to use the input signal. Okay, because it means that the noise at this time frequency point is very, very high compared to the clean speech. So all this is fine. The only problem is that the, uh, the power of the speed signal, which is sigma s here, depends on the latent code. And therefore, I need to take the expectation of over this latent code. Okay, so this is why I have this ugly expectation in the problem. So basically, it is a, this is an, an expected uh, Wiener filter. So let's us, let us take a look to the first results we have obtained. So here we compare uh, the audio only variational latent color in blue with the visual only variational latent color, the audio visual variational latent color and the supervised one. Now what I am plotting here are three different um, standard measures that we use to, to evaluate the, uh, the quality of speed signal. And uh, for each of these measures, I am plotting the improvement with respect to the input signal. Uh, what does it mean? It means that, uh, so, and in the x-axis, you have the input noise, okay? The SNR, actually. So on the right, which is have 15 dB, dB decibels of SNR, the noise is very, very, is very small compared to the clean speech. And therefore, it is very difficult to improve the quality over, over the noise emission because it's not that noisy. This is why you see that all the curves towards the right part of the diagram, they kind of go down because improving over the input is very difficult because the input is not quite noisy. On the left part of the curves, it is very difficult as well because the input is very noisy and having a good improvement there, it's actually very challenging, okay? Uh, so this is why these curves have kind of this bell shape, uh, roughly speaking. Uh, another important detail is that what we have proposed is all the visual uh, variation of the encoder is uh, outperforming most of the times or doing very similar, if not, the supervised method. And this actually demonstrates the ability and the interest of being able to adapt to a noise at test time. And finally, as uh, you can imagine, this audiovisual variation of the encoder is most of the time improving or doing at least as good as the best between the audio only and the visual only uh, audio. So what, does, what is the problem of this uh, audio visual VAE is that it is exploiting video systematically. So no matter the quality of the video signal, we are using the video signal. And in real world applications, this is a bit, um, it's not sweet, suitable all the time. So you can see here examples in which you have occlusions, self occlusions and um, non-frontal uh, faces, which make the visual information hard to exploit. So we have proposed two alternatives to this. The first one is what we call the VAE mixture model. So given the audio only and the audiovisual VAE generative models, 
we have proposed that the spectrogram is actually a mixture of these two, a mixture in the probabilistic sense, as in Gaussian mixture model. So how do we how do we model that in practice? Is that we have a variable alpha m, which is switching between the audio only and the audio visual VA. Okay, so sorry. When you have to write this down formally, you you do it that way, which complicates things a bit, but you don't have to be, I mean, I mean, conceptually it's very simple. Alpha M is choose between audio only and audio visual VA. When alpha N is zero, you have the audio visual VA, and when alpha N is one, you uh, have the audio V. Now, the interesting part here is that you don't know what alpha N has to be. And you have to estimate that at this time together with the parameters of the noise and together with uh, the speech signal. Okay, so this is one of the moments in which I skipped the mathematical derivations because they are uh, quite dense. And uh, I can send later a list of references if you are uh, interested. Uh, and then when we take a look, when we compare this uh, with the with the two um, generative pre-trained generative models that we are using, uh, we can see that the turquoise curve, which is the mixture, uh, is doing uh, most of the times as uh, as good as the best of uh, of the two models, especially when there is noise in the uh, in the visual uh, frames, which are here, uh, which is the the two curves uh, on the right. Okay, so basically here we took a, a very uh, clean data set and we add noise on purpose to see the impact of. The so this is one uh, of the alternatives that we have provided to the uh, systematic audiovisual fusion. And another one is to consider a single decoder, but uh, having the encoder being a mixture between two different encoders. Okay, so this time the mixture happens at the level of the encoder and not at the level of the decoder as in the previous case. Uh, so, the formalization is quite similar. The main difference is that now the decoder is single. It's, you have one single decoder. So this is why this alpha M does not appear on the first line, but it appears on the prior distribution. Yes. Um, and also in the encoder that I did not write here. Um, but the principle is the same. So if your alpha M is equals to one, you are in the blue case and you will choose the audio only. And if the alpha is equals to zero, you're in the red case and you will choose video only. And when we compare this uh, um, with the previous uh, alternative, we can see that our red curve, sorry, that the green curve, sorry, is uh, outperforming not only the blue and the red, which are basically the two architectures that we build upon, but also the concatenation, the systematic concatenation of audio and vision that is a turquoise. And once more, this is um, even more clear when you have a noisy or artifact data, which is the two curves on the right. So just to summarize, um, uh, VAE are a very nice methodological tool for unsupervised learning and unsupervised representation learning. Another very interesting point is that combinations of VAE with other probabilistic models are endless. So I didn't have time to add it here on the slides, but uh, on Friday we got the good news that uh, um, what we, we have a new model that appeared, it is called switching VAE, and it's basically uh, a composition of hidden Markov models and variational autoencoders. So this will appear at ICASP this year. The only problem that we have with VAE is this nonlinearity that boils down to complex training and inference procedures. And this makes things run slow sometimes. Uh, we are thinking about alternative to this, but it is not um, so, it's not so straightforward. Um, now, one limitation of, uh, so you remember I presented the systematic fusion of auditory and visual data, and then two alternatives which are the VAE mixture model with uh, where the mixture happens at the decoder 
and the mixture of inference networks where the mixture happens at the encode. But in these two cases, we are basically learn when to ignore the video. But what we should be doing is learning how to clean the visual data. Okay, so this is another, it's, it's another problem, but of course it is highly related. And we are also investigating that in the team, not necessarily with, uh, with PA. Now, um, and another interesting thing would be how to automatically select the fusion mechanism. So this is another level of abstraction. Uh, and, and this is actually not so, not so easy and clear how to do it. Finally, another interesting point that we are have, and we are investigating this for a year now, um, it's how to put a temporal model onto the latent code. So uh, as for now, all these Z are independent for each other, from each other. Uh, but of course, the speed signal is uh, a signal that has high temporal correlation. So it would be interesting to um, put a temporal model on the latent variable. And what we have done until now is uh, release a review on this topic, I mean, on models that have this property. Um, all these models were kind of proposed, um, I wouldn't say independently, but, uh, but th th it wasn't clear what was the relationship between them. So what we did in this review is define an umbrella under which all these models fit uh, with general properties. Uh, and, um, and then of course, properties that are not general, that are specific to each of the models. And we call these dynamic variational autoencoders. And I invite you to check our preprint that is on archive, as well as the code, because we have actually re-implemented the list of the models that you can see, see here in the third point. And the code is uh, actually already available. Sorry, there is a mistake on the slide. The code is actually already available. So all the, all the information can be found uh, on, on the archive page. And with this, I will find my presentation. And thank you for your attention. And I'll be happy to take questions as I said, if you feel more comfortable to ask the question in Spanish, I am I'm very fine with that. Okay, Xavi, thank you very much for your talk. So if there are any questions, please uh, feel free to write your name in the chat. And uh, I, will manage, I, I will manage the question terms in order. Otherwise, I, I have a set of questions in any case that... <laughs> well, I, I can start, I think. Okay, well, feel free to write your name in any case if you have any question to ask. So, Xavi, for me, um, well, very interesting talk. Um, as you know, I'm not an expert on this field uh, at all. And I would like to uh, start with a simple and quite straightforward question is, are um, variational encoders are commonly employed, um, and we could and we could consider them the state of the art in most audiovisual tasks, or there are other approaches having equal or superior success in many of these audiovisual approaches. Um, okay, so I think that uh, it depends on on the task and on what you want to learn. Um, so. Uh, you have seen for many of the visual audiovisual tasks, there are other architectures that are actually quite powerful. Uh, I believe it depends on the amount of data that you have for this task. So if you have a really huge training set for the task at hand, for instance, or the visual speech enhancement, if you have a really huge training set, I'm not sure that the strategies that we propose here are the ones that have the highest performance. Um, the reason is that at the end, in terms of modeling, uh, even if they have an, they model an unreal relationship between the latent variable and the observation, they are, let's say, quite simple. Okay? We don't use architectures that are too deep. Um, so. If you have a really huge training set, I think you can do things that are different from VAEs and that are that will probably work better. The problem is that uh, if you don't have 
a huge training set. Then you need to use um, architectures that are adapted to the amount of data you have. So in our case, uh, as I said, we don't have access to the noise at test time. So during training, we, we, don't, we don't see any noise sample. So this means that the only noise we have for training a noise model is the one we see at test time. And therefore, our noise model has to be relatively simple, I would say. Um, this is why we learn uh, a model for the clean data. And then learning a model for the clean data is mu it's a much simpler task than learning a model to the noise, whatever kind of noise. And this is why we can use less data and we can use a simpler architecture. So uh, the answer is yes and no, depending on how much data do you have. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, up to which extent all these speech models you learn from clean data are speaker independent? That's, that's a very interesting question. Um, uh, if you have enough data from, from the speaker of interest, it's better to train your model with that data on. Or you could start with a mixture of, uh, I don't know how many speakers and then fine tune with the speaker of interest. Because of course the model is going to work better. We, ha we have experiments showing that. I mean, this is uh, experimentally, this is a claim that this is absolutely validated, even if I didn't show this in the talk. Okay. Uh, now, once again, is the problem of the data. Now, if you don't know which speaker uh, are you going to deal with, then uh, you have to learn. Um, you have to learn with with what you have. Okay. So, for many applications, you can imagine having a you know a robot or a booth uh, in a in a public uh, in a public place. Uh, you have no idea who is going to come to talk to the booth or to the robot, right? So there is no point in, uh, in having a speaker dependent model. Now you could imagine a situation in which you don't know the speaker, but you are going to have, um, uh, let's say the same speaker for a long time. So for instance, what we are doing today is a clear example. And uh, you could imagine a method that starts from speaker independent uh, model, and then together with the uh, learning of the noise and, uh, and, the, and speech enhancement, at the same time, we're updating the model for the clean speech, uh, but this is something that we did, we did not investigate. Uh, I think we didn't have data sets for that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions. Uh, well, Guillermo, Guillermo Gomez, go ahead, please. Thanks. Uh, hello, Xavi, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, really interesting. I had a question related to the use of variational autoencoders uh, instead of co conditional GAN. Uh, uh, one phenomenon seen on variational autoencoders is the output uh, tends to be, uh, especially with the mean square error, tends to be soft, soft and, uh, and blurry. How you, how does uh, does this affect to the output in the sound environment you work with? Uh, have you listened to these reconstructions and clean out your um, what kind of phenomena do you uh, appreciate or see in these reconstruction samples? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, that's that's a good question. Um, uh, so, I think first of all, I'd like to re uh, recall this difference. Uh, so, as you, as you say, uh, first point in VAEs, um, when trained with Euclidean distance we can see this blurry effect. We have even seen it with the phase examples they have shown. Okay, phases are quite smooth, let's say. Um, uh, so this is because there is, we, are, we are learning an average behavior. Okay. Um, now on the, on the sound uh, part, um, I, I would say that, um, I think it, it, it's. I think we have some effects like this. The the problem I would say is that we have a much. Um, I think this is not the main problem, and and 
So as I said, uh, speech is a temporal signal. And when we are using VAEs, plain VAEs, we are not modeling this temporal uh, dimension. And this is a problem. Now, a problem, an, an extra problem to that is that modeling the temporal dimension is very tough. Um, but equivalently in images is as, as if we were not using convolutional convolutions for modeling the, the image, right? This is nonsense because we know that there is a special relationship between the, the pixels of the image. Okay. So now how to model the temporal dimension of a speed signal? Uh, I think this is, this is difficult. Uh, it's difficult because speech is a non-stationary signal. Uh, it's difficult because uh, the relationship may highly depend on the content of the signal, I mean, on the words, on the phonemes. So I am sure that we have this blurry, blurry effect when we are using VAEs for speech. Uh, but I am quite convinced that this is not the, the word, it's not the worst problem. So once we have solved the problem of modeling the temporal uh, dimension, then I'll, I'll be happy to take a look to the, to the impact of the blurriness, let's say, that is proper to VAs. I don't know if I was uh, clear, it was kind of a complicated answer. No, it was a clear answer for sure. Okay. Uh, can I ask another question uh, related to this? Of course, go ahead. Because, uh, uh, right now you are using a fully connected layers on the, if I remember correctly, right? In the, yes. So you have a fixed side for the, for the audio input. Yes. And you are not modeling the, uh, the uh, temporal dependency. So I can imagine that the, the, the embedding space might be huge in size. Uh, so the embedding space depends on, on the properties of your STFT. Uh, in our case, if I remember correctly, uh, we have, uh, it's 200, either 256 or 512, depending on the, uh, yeah, on the. Uh, on how the long are the sequences you are modeling in, in this embedding space? In China, I mean. Oh, uh, it can be like, uh, I don't know, uh, five or 10 seconds. All right. Yeah. But the thing is that with, with standard VAEs, you don't care like how long these sequences are because you take yeah. all the frames independently. So you can actually mix the, the, uh, the frames and you would obtain the same model. Mm -hmm. And this is why we think that I mean, this is a huge problem, right? Because of course the content, I mean, the way you model a certain frame, if you have information of the past frames, then this is very hard. Sure. Yes. And the last question, yeah, uh, uh, I had it in, on my mind because on the supervised uh, scenario, mm -hmm. you you compare uh, with every source of noise used during training for the supervised model, or how do you incorporate the results of the supervised model against your your results? Uh, was it clear? I can rephrase it. No, no, I say you're asking me, uh, well, I will provide an answer and then you tell me if this is the answer okay. to your question. <laughs> uh, so if, if we test the supervised model with um, noise types that have been seen during training, uh, then the supervised model does quite good. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But if we, if we test with noise types that haven't been seen during training, then uh, VA is to, I mean, our strategy is that do better. But of course, I mean, it's quite unfair to, to try with noise types that one of the architectures has seen during training, right? Mm -hmm. Because then you don't, you don't compare the same thing. You have to test with things that neither of them has seen during training. So do you provide any kind of noise during training for the supervised model? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the supervised model was trained. I mean, we, had, we just took it and, and used it. We didn't train it ourselves as long as I can uh, remember. Or, yeah, I should have right. to double check that, but yeah. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Xavi. I have no, no more question left. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thank you, Guillermo. So Xavi, from my side, another question. These um, dynamical variational autoencoders that we, we can see in this slide, 
mm -hmm. um, are variational autoencoders that also model the temporal dependencies within a data sequence. Could you tell us a bit more about the main strategies follow and the main conclusions you reach in this um, research? Uh, yes. To do that, let me. Uh, uh, I will just let me retrieve the the manuscript so that uh, that I can show it, and maybe this is going to be a bit more. Uh, explanatory uh, I don't know I'm not sure you can see that now just give me a second um, I, I will have to reshare the uh, the screen sorry so let me stop sharing but Okay, so this is no presentation for that. It's a pure uh, document that you can see. Um, so, basically, yes. So in VAEs, um, so in dynamical VAEs, we model the observation and the latent code with a dependency on the previous one. That doesn't ignore you here. Okay, we don't care about this right now. So this is the principle. Okay, you have a sequence, and every time you model the current observation on latent code, uh, conditioned by the previous ones. This is a very general principle. It's not only uh, dynamical VAs. Okay. So for instance, one way of doing that, if you want to plot diagram, let me zoom in is like this okay uh, so you have your z again once again that does ignore the u these are your latent codes and then each latent code is now actually depend on all the previous observations okay which is something that you cannot do with vae so this is to say in speech would be given all what has have been said previously what is the distribution of my latent code which is actually very interesting because it means that if I am half a sentence and I start the word, I don't know, potato, of course the latent code, if I am half the word potato, the latent code doesn't have the same distribution. That is, I am half the word, uh, I don't know, acknowledge, right? It's a very, it has to be very different distribution of the latent code if I am halfway. So knowing the previous um, spectrograms for sure needs to help me to, um, to have a better uh, model for the latent code, as well as for the, for the observation, of course. And then the other interesting thing is that now you can have all sorts of, um, let's say, arrows between latent codes and observations in all possible senses, depend on, depending on how they implement this relationship. So now, as a matter of, uh, we run some experiments for, again, on the clean speech. Uh, maybe I will show this table. Um, and our conclusion is, at least for this task, the best model is what is called SRNN, um, which stands for Stochastic Recurrent Neural Networks, but be careful because STORN also stands for this. So there are two different papers with the same title, but they have different acronyms, okay? So anyway, so we have this SRNN, and this is for the task of speech model. But when you try to use these models for speech enhancement, then they kind of reorder, the performance reorder. And this is because SRNN is a very complicated model, and numerically it's very difficult to to make it train so if this is one thing and the other thing is that when you want to sample data from that you have to do it in a sequential manner so if you make a mistake you will take this mistake with you for the whole chain until the end and therefore the sampling mechanism here is very unstable especially for long sequences so I know this is very abstract because we did not discuss these models, but yeah, this this would be a, 
uh, too many things. Uh, so of course, I, I we, we did a big pedagogical effort uh, in the sense that we presented this umbrella um, and then we rewrote each of these models, all of them, actually, uh, within this umbrella. I mean, methodologically, we present the equations, we present the inference, we actually discuss sometimes the inference is, um, how to say that, it is uh, an approximation of them in terms of probabilistic dependencies. So we discuss them, we discuss the fact that the authors chose something that is, you know, they could have chosen something that would be better or more accurate, but they did a different choice. So um, if you go through these papers and some of these you find difficulties in understanding, I would suggest that you go to this review uh, and that you try to reread the chapter that corresponds to, uh, to this method. And because we made really an effort to explain this as clearly as possible, at least from our understanding. Thank you very much. At least we have an idea now about dynamical variation a lot encoders, so thanks a lot. I don't know if there are any questions, any remaining questions. No? So, because otherwise we can finish here this seminar. Okay, so thanks, thanks for okay. your uh, questions and your insights. I was very happy to... Uh, uh, be able to speak about what we are doing here. Okay, so thanks to you, Xavi, for this nice talk, and thanks to all the attendees for for your presence. And I think we can finish here this seminar, Eugenio. Yes, I, I think so. Um, see you next uh, Monday in the in a new seminar of Tatsi. And um, thank you very much, Xavi, uh, for your. Uh, interesting and insightful uh, talk. Uh, thanks for attending our invitation. Thanks, uh, thanks to you for inviting me. It was my pleasure to be here today. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you to everybody.